Welcome to another episode of the Divorce Survival Guide podcast, where we have real, honest, smart, and sometimes even hilarious conversations about co-parenting, separation, and divorce, and all that goes along with that. I'm Kate Anthony, your Divorce Survival Guide, Certified Life and Relationship Coach, and Happily Divorced Mom, who helps women decide if they should stay in or leave their marriages, and then guides them through the process one step at a time. Hey everyone, thanks for joining me for another episode of the Divorce Survival Guide podcast. Today I have an awesome guest interview for you, but before we get to the wonderful and amazing Karen McMahon of Journey Beyond Divorce, I want to tell you of a few exciting changes that are coming up. So basically, the podcast is getting a facelift. So, all right, the first thing you may have noticed already is that we have new cover art. So don't be surprised if the podcast looks different in the whatever app you use to listen. Um, It's still me and the same content that you have come to love and appreciate. But after almost two years, I thought it was time to have a little bit of a refresh of some stuff around here. So um, that's one of them. Um, And then starting in November, there are a few other changes that are coming your way. The first is a new intro. So again, don't be surprised if you hear me saying different things, right? Your ear kind of gets attuned to what I say to my intro, right? So we're just going to shake that up a little bit. And so that'll come starting in the next episode that you hear. And then, you know, the other thing that is really exciting is that starting in November, uh, the Divorce Survival Guide podcast will be coming to you weekly as opposed to twice a month. So twice a month, I'm now going to be doing dedicated solo episodes where I'm going to talk to you about things that I think are super important. And a lot of times these topics are going to be called from the conversations that we're having over in my Facebook group. So please, if you are not in that group, be sure to join today. I cannot stress to you the importance of the conversations that we're having over in that group. It's super active. It's super, super engaged. And if you want more personal access to me, that's where you're going to get it. Uh, I'm in there a lot answering people's questions and building relationships in there. So the, you can find the link in the show notes as always, or you can search, should I stay or should I go in your Facebook browser? And it will come up for you. Again, this group is for women only. Okay. So the last change that you're going to hear in the next few months is that I'll be having some sponsors of the podcast which means that I will be doing some super organic, not cheesy advertising. Now, this is really exciting to me because it means that I'll be able to bring you more and more of the free content that you love. The only reason that I will be able to be doing this podcast for you weekly is because of these sponsorship relationships that I'm developing. So here's the deal. I am going to be very picky about the sponsors I bring on, and I will never bring on a sponsor or advertise anything to you that I haven't a personally tried and that doesn't directly relate to you. So for example, one of my future sponsors is a co-parenting app that I have been road testing and that I simply love. And I think it'll help ease your burdens. So sponsorship, sponsorship with this company makes a lot of sense. It makes sense to me. And more importantly, it makes sense to you. Okay, so that's it for the changes. Let's dive into today's episode. So today I bring to you my interview with Karen McMahon. Karen is the founder of Journey Beyond Divorce, and it is her absolute passion, as is mine, to help men and women navigate the emotional difficulties of relationships, breakups, and divorce. Karen truly believes that doing this sort of deep exploration will open up the possibility that your current relationship challenges can lead to a rewarding voyage of self-discovery and an immensely more pleasing life experience. Uh, Karen founded Journey Beyond Divorce in 2010 after discovering that the pain of dissolving her own marriage had been the very stimulus for her personal transformation. And you know that I am down with that story. So here now is my conversation with Karen McMahon. Karen, thank you so much for being here and for sharing your wisdom with my people. I am very excited. Thanks for the invite. Yeah. Um, 
so your company, your, your business, your coaching practice, your divorce coach, and what you, your company is called journey beyond divorce. And I think that, you know, we've, we've talked about, and we're in, in agreement on the fact that no matter where you are in your process, right, whether you're approaching divorce, whether you're in the middle of it, or whether you are in fact beyond it, right? The whole thing is an arc. There's a journey, right? to get through it. And that no matter where you are, whether you're trying to decide to stay or go, which is the focus of a huge part of my work with women, um, whether you're in the middle of it, it doesn't matter, right? They're so, it's so emotionally charged from start to finish. It's so emotionally charged. and, And I chose that name because as you're saying, every piece of it is its own journey a journey to acceptance that this is what you have to do, a journey to Mm -hmm. um, forgiveness, which is a very bumpy, long journey often, Uh, a journey to acceptance on the other side of, oh my goodness, now the, the fight is over, the legal battle is over, and I still have a relationship with this person if I have children. Like every piece of it is this unfolding journey. And I think that, uh, rather than yearning for the destination, learning through the journey is really a big part of what makes the difference and allows us to grow and be healthier, right? I love that. I love that. And I was just having a conversation just just like this with a client of mine who's in the should I stay or should I go conversation. And we were also talking about femininity and leaning into... Um, the feminine, and how uncertainty and not being in the not knowing and being in the journey is actually a very sort of sacredly feminine place. Like it's a very surrendered feminine place. Absolutely. Absolutely. And holding that space. And and I think that um, learning how to trust that you don't need to have all of the answers and that just being there, um, tuning into the next best step uh, is our guide. That's that intuitive guide. Yes. Yes. And I, I love that, right? That it is, it's the net being in the process, being, being aware of just the next, you know, as you and I have similar language around this about taking the next right action. This is not about taking all of the steps. It's Mm -hmm. not about getting to the other side quickly because you can get to the other side quickly, but you've just kind of stepped over and skipped a whole bunch of really important shit that's going to catch up to you in the end. So you may as well not skip it. Right. Right. Um, but that it is, it's a, it's a slow process that only requires you to take the next action and then the next action. That's so true. And uh, some of my clients who struggle with that, you know, I, uh, what I like to say is if I could give you a fast forward button and you could just jump over all of this, Mm -hmm. you would, you would miss the treasure in the pain, right? Like all of the personal growth, you would be the same on the other side. And what would you do? You would meet the same guy or the same gal in a different body and rinse and repeat. So as painful as the journey is, the journey is, um, is more about us getting to a new place than, um, than just getting to the end of the divorce. That's so gorgeous. And it's exactly, as you know, like so in line exactly with, you know, we could, we, we're, we're speaking the same language, girl, <laughs> right? It sucks. And, you know, this is why the divorce rate for second and third marriages is it's so fucking high. Exactly. Exactly. Because people um, want to fast forward. They don't want to feel it. They don't want to deal with it. Well, you know, whatever you skip over and don't feel is going to come right back at you in a different way. Yeah. Yeah. I think that a saying that I'll hear is why does this keep happening to me Mm -hmm. as opposed to, right. Let's turn that around. What is it that I continue to do to create and draw this relationship type 
into my life. And, and that's the difference. And I think you and I spoke about this prior is that constantly putting the mirror up and looking at your part in and how you've gotten where you are and where you want to go. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And I always say, even if he was one raving motherfucker, you still yeah. chose him. You right. still have some part in this dynamic, right? He could have been, you know, it's not about fault or blame. It's about responsibility. It's about, and there's nothing more empowering than personal responsibility. There's just nothing. Right? And that's what I was just going to say. All of the power, while you're focusing on your spouse or your ex or your soon to be ex, you have no power in that space. Exactly. When you're focusing on yourself and divorce is, there's so much about the process of divorce that's out of our control. Mm -hmm. There's just so much. You, you can't control your attorney. If you're in court, you certainly can't control the unfolding of that. You have no control over your soon to be ex. But the one place where you have control and power is in you and the decisions you make in noticing your reactions in changing your thought patterns in noticing and adjusting behaviors. And that's actually why we created the 12 step program, the 12 step divorce recovery program, because we, we basically took um, me and my partner, Lisa took all of the coaching we'd done over years and said, what are the, the obstacles that our clients consistently face and how can we create like a roadmap and it's really about the emotions of an emotional roadmap to help them number one keep the focus on themselves mm -hmm. number two grow and feel empowered through the process that can feel um really out of control yes i love it I love that. So speaking of your 12 step program, so this is your, you have a 12 step program. T tell us a little bit, little broad overview of the program since you, since you mentioned it. Yeah. So we have a 12 step divorce recovery program that um, is not the, the Al-Anon alcoholic anonymous type of 12 steps. It's really steps that we created based on the emotional um, obstacles that, that our clients have faced, like looking at all of our clients that are pretty standard and pretty typical. And so um, one talks about conflict and one talks about chaos and one talks about healing and one talks about presence and one talks about judgment and one talks about resistance. And so mm. what we did was we said, what are the elements that, that clients tend to trip over and struggle with? And, and, you know, my experience has been that divorce is absolutely painful. There's no doubt about it. And yet there's a lot of suffering that happens that's not necessary. Yeah. And, and so the 12 steps is really to help you navigate the pain, noticing your part in the suffering and using that as an opportunity to refine, heal, grow throughout this difficult process. Mm, yeah, I love that. What is it? What, what is the slogan? The uh, pain is uh, pain is necessary. Suffering is optional, right? Is that yes, what it is? Exactly. That's exactly. I'm reaching back into my yes. <laughs> back in my brain. Um, yeah, absolutely. Right. And yeah. there are. So, what do you say to clients who are suffering and really sort of, you know, there are people who are actually com quite committed to their suffering. Yes. Yes. And yeah. so I, even this morning, I was speaking to a new, a new person who called and just so much suffering and so much struggling. And one of the things I find is uh, resistance, resistance to what is mm. resistance, perhaps to the fact that you had to get a divorce, which resistance could mean guilt and shame and fear resistance to how your spouse shows up. This is one of my, this is where I tend to get people to chuckle. Um, I can't believe he did X, Y, and Z. Oh, okay. Has he ever done it before? Constantly for the last 15 years of our marriage. <laughs> You're okay, right. so I want you to notice and explain to me and you why you can't believe. And then the light bulb goes off. Right. 
well, like actually I can believe and just what is staying in I can't believe and I'm surprised and upset doing for you? And, and so the shift out of resistance, now you don't have to like whatever the behavior is, but accepting that that is that person's way of being. Yeah. Instead of being shocked and appalled and surprised and upset and triggered by it, immediately brings some space, immediately allows for actually a shift in energy to, well, now that I accept it, what are my options? Right. So if your spouse always shows up late to pick up the kids, instead of constantly being triggered, how about a plan B? So if, for instance, he shows up late the next time, it has no impact on you. And that's the kind of thing that allows um, allows people, in my opinion, to shift out of suffering. Yeah, I love that. I love that, right? Because you can't control him. And if he's somebody who's always late and he consistently shows up late and you know that he's going to be late, your, you know, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result, right? So you're, if you expect him to be on time and continue to get mad when he's not on time, you're the crazy one. It, I mean, you know, or your part in the crazy dance. Exactly. It's like that's it's it's your part in the crazy dance. <laughs> and step one in the 12 step program is curb the conflict. OK. And so everyone can relate to that. It's like no matter what kind of a divorce you're getting and you're getting a divorce, there's conflict. And 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 even if you're conflict avoidant, for those of you mm. listening who are conflict avoidant, yeah. Conflict isn't just fighting. Conflict is feeling, feeling worried and anxious, frustrated, like all the inner conflict. And so step one of the 12-step program speaks to both of those. How do you begin to curb the conflict? And the first thing and the, the most important tool that comes out of step, step one is to slow your reaction, right? To create some space bite your tongue. Don't, don't jump on the keyboard and write back. Don't lash out with your words. Like take a couple of deep breaths, create some space, notice what's going on with you. Notice, are you going from zero to a hundred and are you really triggered in 12 step programs? They say when it's hysteric, when it's hysterical, hysterical it's, it's historical. historical. <laughs> yep. So it's like, if you have a zero to a hundred reaction, he or she, your spouse is just the messenger. That reaction dates back to earlier in your life. That's something that you've experienced over and over again. When you create space and you slow your reaction, you have that opportunity to say, I know what's going on with him or her. I like know their faults, right? Up one side and down the other. What's going on with me? And again, that's where the treasure is. That's yep. where the gifts are. That is where the gold is. I mean, it is so where the gold is. There was a a reading, I remember a reading in the Courage to Change about that, right? Putting About putting spiritual space between yourself and the problem. And that was, all, it's always one of the, like, you know, this was 25 years ago, 20 years ago that I first read that was like, oh, like, what is that? And I love the fact that it was spiritual space, right? But there's putting spiritual space between myself and my problem will then slow my reaction, right? I almost feel like I want to get into that a little bit deeper only because I think you and I speak at a, you know, have experience with this, but for people who are kind of new to this or in the middle of it, like, what does it mean to slow a reaction? What does it mean to put space between yourself and your reaction or your spiritual space? between yourself right. and the problem. And, and I think the, the, a good place to start is to understand the reactiveness. And so when we're triggered, and um, Eckerd Tolle calls it the pain body, mm. in like a flash of a second, this pain body takes over. I mean, we've all experienced it, right? It's like you want to text back right away. You want to lash back right away. And what happens is that emotional wave is like a fog and you have temporarily lost access to your logical mind. Yes. In that moment, it's like, just like you can't see a foot ahead of you in a thick fog when you're driving, you can't see 
logically. And so when you lash out in that moment, it's that's why it's called blind rage. Right. Right. Because you're blind. You're not seeing. And it is, I mean, it is like a, there is a sort of, um, you know, uh, neurological by brain, like something's happening in your brain that creates that, right? This is your fight, flight, or freeze moment, right? And you're fighting. Your lizard brain is taken over. Your conscious mind actually goes away. So right. it's not exactly. It's not your fault. Like it's it. This is this is primitive. This is primal shit, <laughs> right? That you know this whole amygdala takeover of the brain yes. is like. It, this is this is real. It's like, and I think that in those moments, it's easy to, especially if you've been raised by or lived with someone who's critical, mm-hmm. it's easy right afterwards to shame yourself and guilt yourself. I've had clients say, like, I hate the human being I've become. Like, I don't know what's wrong with me. I'm crazy. Yeah. And it's like in those moments when your conscious mind is disappears momentarily, you are in a moment of insanity, which is why the beauty of creating space is, is so important. And a question to ask yourself would be, well, what's the worst thing that happens if I don't respond? To yeah. What's the worst thing that happens if I pick up my phone and then I put it back down and I don't text back right away? And what's the best thing that happens? Mm-hmm. Right? Because then the wave goes away. And again, I go to 12 step a lot. They say, if you're upset, count to 10. If you're really upset, count to 100. That's literally, literally the amount of time it takes for the pain body to subside, yes. for you to reconnect with your conscious, you know, rational mind. And then you can say, all right, I have two things going on here. And that's the key. You always have two things going on. One is me and my trigger and how I want to deal with that. The other is him or her and the outer circumstances. So whenever we're triggered, there's an outer circumstance to take, to, to figure out and take action on. And then there's the inner, right? The trigger. Mm -hmm. And again, we're back to the gold. Right. Absolutely. I love that. So giving, I think that, that we started talking about sacred space. And so, so number one, understanding what happens that, you know, once you understand it, it's like, yeah, I could see where that space would be helpful. Yes. Right. Yeah. Like I could see the destruction. It's like you're tossing grenades mm-hmm. yes. and there's destruction. Yeah. And so all about is curbing that conflict. Now the other person may be totally conflict oriented. Doesn't matter. If you do your part, if you simply stop, bite your tongue, create space and curb the conflict, that conflict is going to subside. It may not go away altogether, but it will significantly subside when you're not participating. Anymore. Yes, 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 exactly. Because you can't control the other person. You can't control what they're going to do. You can't control their process um, or their growth or their healing or their rage or any of it but you can control your reactions to it. That, that sacred space, that opportunity to, um, and you might not be able to go within in the moment. Certainly I had very young children running around when I was in my highest conflict, but at some point to be able to say, you know, what was that about? Yeah. And when we're triggered, it's either, um, a shortcoming or a healing. Mm-hmm. So we're either looking to refine or to heal. Right. And so just to be open to what what's going on with me, what's the opportunity in the trigger? What's the opportunity in the upset? Yes. Which is, sounds hard. I mean, I have clients go, are you freaking kidding yeah, me? Yeah, what fucking opportunity? <laughs> <laughs> And, and, and yet when they begin to see, wow, oh, wow. Have you ever done that before? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Who else do you do it with? Okay. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. How does that behavior serve you? It doesn't. How would it be to let go of what's not serving you through the difficulty of this and, and, and adopt new behaviors that are more aligned with who you want to be? beautifully you begin to it's like the lotus flower yeah. right? you begin to emerge right. in a really different way and it and it it is it is 
the, the, I think the lotus, while it is such a sort of ubiquitous metaphor, it, nothing could be more apt for divorce if you choose to take that path, right? Literally nothing could be more apt than something that grows out of the darkest, murkiest, muddiest <laughs> bottom of a dirty ass lake, right? Or pond. Absolutely. And then blooms into this beautiful glory on the surface and, and has to make its way up through the murky water to the surface to bloom. Yeah. It's fucking it's gorgeous, perfect. It's, right? It's a perfect metaphor for what, yeah, for what divorce is all about. Yeah. Yeah. It really is. And, and I think that, that hand in hand, um, so that conflict is often what happens, you know, between our ears, like how we're thinking about things, how we're looking at things. And in our society, I, I really feel that, you know, emotions or something to be stuffed or numbed or, you know, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, go out and get laid by a guy, like whatever. Mm -hmm. And yet, and yet the healing part, it's, it's such a loss. And even, I mean, I decided to leave, whether you've been left or you decided to leave, none of us stand before whatever our altar is and commit to another person thinking, yeah, maybe, maybe not. Right. You know, <laughs> right. None of us plan on being in this really painful place. And so the loss is very real. And, and as a result, if you don't feel the feelings and step two is heal the hurt, mm. it's really about tuning into the feelings and, and, Crying is part of it, but really, really being with in that same sacred way, being with all of the feelings, both the shame and guilt, the fear, the regret, the hurt, the confusion, the uncertainty, being with those and processing those and releasing them. Yeah. It's like vomiting when you have a sour stomach. If you let that out, your belly heals faster. Right. And so, so does your heart. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. And, you know, people are always saying like, how do I heal? How do I, you know, how do I get through this? And, you know, the, the grief and the, and there's no shortcut through grief. There's just not. And it's, and every it's, no one likes to hear it, <laughs> but the, but the, you know, the truth is that the only way over is through. And grief is not linear. And, no. um, and I, I lost my dad back in 2012. Mm -hmm. And at that point, I had been coaching for a couple of years. And what was fascinating to me was, you know, I was in all of this low energy, and I wanted to get out of it. And I was trying to coach myself out of it. And it's like, there's a few things that you can't coach yourself out of, right? Like you can't coach yourself out of grief, you can't coach yourself out of hormonal reaction. Um, <laughs> And, and, and like, there's, there's a process for these things. And so with grieving, you could have a friend who, you know, gets over their divorce and moves on in six months, and it could take you a much longer time. And there's no right or wrong. There's no one path. Um, there's no special formula as, as much as our DNA is different. Mm -hmm. So too is the way that we grieve. And if you have something that happened prior to your divorce that you didn't grieve, what I've learned is that it compounds. And so the more yeah. we grieve, even little losses, the, the more our heart heals to be able to handle the next one because it's life. So there's going to be losses, right? Our step five actually is uh, is grow through grief, and um, the woman who I who I speak with, who's also a coach, is a grief specialist, mm. and you know, and there's a lot of conversation in there about the different ways of processing it, and of course, talking. But what if you're not an external processor and journaling? But what if you're not a journaler? And so, so many different suggestions of the many different flavors and ways that you can honor where you are and what you're feeling and process it so that you can release it yes. so that you can heal from right. it. Right. And you, and you, you know, you're not journaling. So you don't feel, so you don't feel it. You're not um, talking to people. So you don't feel it. You're not right. You're 
processing does not mean skipping over. Scott, processing is about going all the way through it. And it's and I think we definitely we have a society whether you're binging on Netflix or you're going out for cocktails or you're taking a pharmaceutical drug or you're working out and running 10 miles a day. like there's so many ways where our society numbs and avoids and and it's actually kind of like an underlying message yeah. you know like like you're weak like yeah. you're, what what's your problem come on get on with it it's not that big of a deal or or how about this one he or she isn't worth it as if that has any impact on the healing that you have right, to do right right really you're going to give him that power like buck up like don't give him the satisfaction of seeing you cry or all all of that right or like he's just a piece of shit anyway you're you're worth so much more and it's actually, it's just all about you. It's all about you and your beautiful, gorgeous, unique heart and the brokenness that you're feeling mm. and the time and space that you uniquely need to mend. That's so beautiful. And there's no wrong. There's no wrong. There's no wrong no. way of doing it. There, there really is. Well, Except to not do it, right? That's, I guess, yes, exactly, right? There's no, there's no wrong yeah. way to do it. You just, but you got to do it. And, and I think that the, the only caveat I have to that is, you know, one of the phases and what they call the first phase of grief is denial. And if you've found yourself stuck in denial and not, I, it's like a pendulum, not bouncing back and forth mm. to any of the others. Um, then you probably need to speak to somebody and 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 move beyond the denial because all of the the the, the, the denial, the depression, the anger, the the bargaining, the acceptance. It's it's all part of it. And what I tell my clients is. The first time you touch acceptance, and acceptance is so incredibly multi-layered, but the first time you touch acceptance, it's like, okay, you're going to bounce back and forth, but you're moving throughout. You're moving right. through it. So it may feel like it's too long or too mm -hmm. deep or too hard. Uh, you do want to feel movement. If you're simply stuck in denial, yes. then that is... And I, 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 I love that. I thank you. And thank you for saying that. And also, you know, I think it's really important to, I, I love the idea that you're bouncing, right? That you really are, that there is movement and that some people will look at that and feel that and think they're crazy or think that they are, uh, there's something wrong with their process, right? Actually the movement through denial, acceptance, rage, like all of the stages, whatever they are, right? And I think that they're not as static as the the seven stages, right? I think that there's right. lots of shit going on, right? And, and it could have different manifestations. Right. Like your anger may not look like outward rage. It might be like a slow boil. Like you don't, we all have different ways um, of experiencing and processing these things. But that like, if you're actually bouncing all around, this is good. <laughs> this is like an energetic movement and flow, right? And it can feel very yeah. um, wrong and bad when you've been in um, acceptance to then find yourself under the covers, not wanting to get out of bed. And like, and, and this judgment, like, Oh my God, what's wrong with me? Yeah. I've I thought I was I've, over this. I've, I've made it a wrong turn. Um, I, I need help. It's like, it's just another layer. It's, it's like the scab. It's just another layer. Honor it. And, and it, brings, um, it brings me back to the thought of resistance. Whatever, what we resist yeah. persists. And so as long as you're willing to be open and honor wherever you are, you will move through it. If you resist it, it's like putting your foot on the brake and sitting still. Yeah. You don't want to do that. So resistance is always, the minute you notice you're in resistance, there is a shift. To make. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And you know, all of this really is awareness, right? Yes. All of this is awareness and being sort of hyper aware of our own process, right? And staying, staying present. You know, I think one of the most important things that you can do through a divorce process is take up a mindfulness practice. 
because you want to stay really present to what, not judgmental, not, you know, but, but present and notice. We, we have um, practice presence is, mm -hmm. is step eight. And um, what we find is people are either yes. fretting the past mm -hmm. or worrying the future. Right. And so it's like, and the only place we have any power is where we are now. And so my business partner says, uh, keep your head where your feet are. And when, and so what happens is when you're, so with all of the legal stuff going on and all the disagreements you might be having with your spouse during the divorce, if you're worrying the uncertainty of the future, which makes sense. It makes sense that you would be worried about it. There's a tremendous amount of uncertainty, but you can't do anything about the emotions that come up as you're envisioning the nightmare that I guarantee you is right. never going to happen about the future. And then your spouse does something, your reactiveness is doubled because it's not just what he or she is doing. It's the fact that you're already triggered from the nightmare that you're thinking about right. that never is going to happen. And you, so you're, you're coming, you're coming with guns blazing, double guns into the present. Whereas when you stay present, it's like, well, what do I know to be true today? right? It's back to how we started the conversation and what's the next step I have to do. Then when something happens, you're there, you're present, you're dealing with it. You actually have mm -hmm. power to deal with it. Um, there's so much of that fretting the past, worrying the future that bleeds our emotional energy. Yeah. And, and a lot power. of that is, you know, it's, it's big fear, which is an inner critic drive, right? And so to just sort of know that that's what's happening. Okay, so this is my inner critic. Okay, great. Um, what is the what is the two percent truth? What is there? What what useful small nugget is my inner critic trying to present to me? What is it trying to protect me from? And everything else we can let go of, right? We reached out to a number of our former clients and asked them if they would if mm. they would write a blog all all on fear. And so we have a series of blogs from mostly women who time after time acknowledge that my greatest fear is never came. That's so great. Um, I love yeah, it. And and it's like oh and over again, like everything I feared, all of those nightmares. And and they'll write, like, look, I, I'm not saying it was a cakewalk. Right. It wasn't easy. Maybe it wasn't easy financially. Maybe it wasn't easy being a single parent and raising a couple of kids. I'm not saying it was easy, but those fear stories, those nightmare stories that I actually expended so much time and energy living into and reacting to never happened, never happened. And so if you're listening and you find yourself going there, it's absolutely understandable because when we're uncertain, our mind wants to fill in the blanks. But you, what you notice is the mind never says, so what if I'm really uh, successful? And what if it's, I find the perfect partner? And what if I live right. in a beautiful <laughs> right. home? And that, that, like, none of those positive what ifs right. come out. Like, where does our mind go? Our mind goes to, what if like hell and damnation is right? What if, I'll ne what if I never fall in love again? What if I, you know, can't support myself and I end up homeless? What if I right. like, <laughs> Right. But those those are the only what ifs, the negative what ifs. And that's just not real. It's just so far from real. Yeah. Yes. And time and time again, we have just had clients come back to us and go, wow. Like I just had one client I reached out to. I couldn't believe I reached out to her to ask her if she would do a, a podcast, a success podcast with me. And it turned out to be her wedding. Ah! And she was the mom of four teenagers divorcing an alcoholic. And her story was, Karen, I'm going to be alone for the rest of my life. The kids are always going to like dad better. I'm always going to, always going to, never going to, never going to. And I reached out to her and she goes, oh my God, Karen, I'm getting married today. Oh. My life is more amazing than I ever imagined. And I know you told me that and I didn't believe you. And I would love to be on your podcast. Um, and I was like, amazing. Wow. Amazing. Wow. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And I always say, you know, that the, that the, the success isn't, I just want to, I just want to say this because the success isn't always, I got remarried. The success right. is also, you know, speaking as someone who's not remarried myself, yep. the, because 
the biggest fear that I hear all the time is what if I never meet anyone? And my response is, what if you don't? What if you don't? What if you become someone who is so happy and confident and loves her life so much that whether she has a man or doesn't have a man doesn't matter? What if your happiness was actually not attached to another person? Now, that's not to say like, sure, I would love to fall in love. I would love to have a partner. Absolutely. And I'm fine. And I'm okay. And I'm fucking great. (laughs) I love you. I love you. Um, And I think that, you know, one of the things, one of the beautiful things that comes out of um, working on yourself through divorce is you refine how you do relationships. A hundred percent. You refine it. Your how you do relation. I do relationship with my children so incredibly different than my mom did relationship. Oh, hell yeah. I and 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 I remember it wasn't this Valentine's Day. I am also um, I have not yet met the man that I'm going to marry and I know I will. And I'm excited about him and us and I'm not there yep, yet. Me too. I'm right, um, right there with you. And, right there with you. Yeah. And, and not everyone wants mm-hmm. that. Um, but, but mm-hmm. that's, that's me. But there was, I think it was two Valentine's days ago. And I thought I have such a depth and wealth of friends and relationships, my relationships with my sisters, with my mom, with my kids, with my church fellowship, with everyone. And I was like, I am so incredibly lucky. And when I was married and before I did all this work, I I never even looked at relationship that way. And so a richness of life is having a relationship with the work you do, with the people that you live around, with your family, with your friends, with your passions, with your desires. And so everything's a relationship. What's your relationship with forgiveness? What's your relationship with money? And when you use this transition of all transitions, which gives you an opportunity to refine every one of those relationships, you emerge brilliantly. and then you're also in an energy space, an emotional energy space where you can, you can manifest what you want because your focus is on what you're capable Mm -hmm. of. Right. And you stand on the shoulders of a success of just navigating this transition and, and, and rocking it. Right. Absolutely. Um, And that I think is what you and I, like, I know it's what we wish for, for every person who is out there. going. Absolutely. A hundred percent. That's exactly what I want. I want for all, especially for women. I want that for women because I think that we are culturally conditioned to believe that we can't have it, that we don't deserve it, that whatever it is. Right. And so you know, if you said to a man, if, if men just don't have that same the cultural conditioning of, you know, they don't, they don't get to have things, <laughs> you know, they don't get nice things. Right. And I think that it's really hard um, if you're listening in and you're in the early stages, you know, what the hell do you mean? Where's the opportunity in this divorce? This thing sucks. This is, this is slaying me. This is like the hardest thing I've ever gone through in my life. And I remember doing a speech once and I was doing some research and um, there was a great quote. I'm not going to do it justice at all, but it talked about how those who have experienced the greatest success did it on the shoulders of what dissolved for them, of some tragedy, of some crisis, of some um, dissolution. And it was out of the ashes of that that they became successful scientists or athletes or having a successful second marriage or just a successful life and relationship with your, like I have two emerging adults. And for me that I have such a gorgeous relationship with my 20 something year old kids is like, it it just brings me all the joy in the world. And, and my old self would not have (laughs) You know, I had a lot of work to do on sure. myself in order to be right. Absolutely. 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 I mean, I, I mean, I feel that way about, about my work, right? My, like I, I would 
neither one of us would be doing what we're doing had we not gone through (laughs) what we went through. And then even, and I think you and I talked about this, even launching your own business is a hard thing. And I think for all of the challenges and difficulties and fears that I've had over the course of the last 10 years launching my business, um, it was the lessons I learned in going through my divorce that gave me the the tenacity, the depth of faith, the um, the encouragement, the ability to ask for what I needed and build the support team that I needed to, to grow a successful business. And so it's not like you emerge from divorce and it's like, oh, this is great. I'm good. No. Yeah. Turn the corner and the next challenge, tribulation, whatever it's going to yeah. be because you, and you want it because we st- like step, step 11 and 12 talks about really um, living in everything we've learned through the first 10 steps and then seeing life as an adventure. Mm that it's not about good and bad. It's actually all good because the bad, having gone through divorce, I know that the bad is is not bad. It's there to grow me and stretch me or send me in a different direction. And so all of a sudden you have a different relationship with the way you do life. I love it. It's so true. It's so true. And it's not, it's not simple or it's not, it's not easy, but it's actually quite simple. Right. That's, that's, that, that's it. It's, it's not easy. It, and, and this kind of work that, that you and I invite people into, it takes tremendous courage. Uh, it's so easy to blame the other person and to see their faults and to just move forward. And like you said in the beginning, and that's why we have such high, high divorce rates for second and third marriages. What's hard is to roll up your sleeves, to be really honest with yourself, to be really vulnerable with your coach Mm -hmm. and to look at these things and to do that hard work of changing, limiting beliefs that that were blueprinted on us when we were young, um, getting rid of the inner critic and, and quieting the voice when it doesn't serve us, looking at, and, and, and our, our step three, which is called calm the chaos, is actually about the chaos in mm-hmm. our head, right? So what drives us is our inner critic, right, and the fear. It's our limiting beliefs of, of what should be or, or will happen. And, and then it's our assumptions and interpretations. And so the way we interpret things, right, the lens we put on, my lens is based on my unforgiveness and my judgments and my insecurities. When I start looking at that lens and changing things, it changes the way I do the world. And so there's just so much for, for people to to see the possibility when they're willing to do this very difficult, emotional, deep work. Yeah. Yep. I beautifully said. Beautiful. Really. Karen, I'm so, I feel like we could talk all day and I'm just, I'm so grateful to you for coming on and sharing this wisdom. This is, it's, it's just, it's just the truth of the matter. It's the heart of it really. And I think it's so important. So thank you so much for, for sharing it all. Thank you for having me on and thank you for for having this podcast. I think that in today's day and age, there's a lot of information out there and I've, you know, your shows are so valuable and they, they guide people so beautifully and we need more of that because that, what you do leads to the kind of healing that makes a big difference and, and the ripple effect from generation to generation. And so I just really want to honor Kate, what you oh, do and, um, and thank, thank you. you. I really appreciate that. I really, really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. We're all in this together, just trying to change the world <laughs> one, one yes. step at a time. So Karen, where, where can people find you? If people, people are interested in this amazing 12 step process that you have, where can they find you? So we have um, a podcast as well. It's on all the platforms and it's called Journey Beyond Divorce. So if you're interested in listening into the 12 steps, um, whatever your platform is, just search Journey Beyond Divorce. And then our website is jbddivorcesupport.com. And we've got articles and a lot of other things that you can find there. And Lots of videos. Yeah, you have lots, lots of videos of you, which is great. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
videos. In fact, on YouTube, we have just little snippet videos of the 12 steps. So if you're thinking I don't have a lot of time to listen, um, Journey Beyond Divorce on YouTube, all the videos like three to five minutes. Smart. So that's another nice way of getting Good. Them. Super yeah. smart. Yeah, yeah. Love it. Thanks. For yeah, of course. Yeah. Of course. All right. Well, more to come with us. We are, you know, clearly aligned in so many, in so many areas. So I'm just really glad to have connected with you and to have brought you here to have this conversation. Thanks for listening to the Divorce Survival Guide podcast. You can find me over at kateanthony.com and be sure to subscribe to this podcast on iTunes so you don't miss an episode. See you next time.